Thank you all. Literally, we saw a corner of your head. Where the cat? Also coming on top of the wall. I know. I'm much slimmer. I should. I had to lock him up. As you can tell, we've got this completely under control. We are going to go a little bit around the horn and go through some Florida athletics since we don't have any for the time being. And uh, let's start with basketball. Let's just, you know, that wound's still open. So let's go ahead and pour some salt right into it. Um, <laughs> if there had been a March Madness and Florida had played, how far do you think they would have gone? Uh, I'm just going to start left to right on my screen and start with Nick. Um, until they lost. That's how the tournament <laughs> works, right? That's a cop out. Um, I, I don't know. I, don't, I think they would have made the tournament. Um, I don't know how far they would have gone. So much of that is matchups. Where are you? Um, I just, I tried to stay positive throughout the season. I, I really lost confidence with the team. It seemed like it, it, the second they had any kind of success, um, they just didn't know how to handle it. And, and you, they would win two or three games in a row and then lose two in a row or lose mm -hmm. three in a row. And uh, it's just a really frustrating team. I don't think Mike White ever – gave up i mean like when uh kentucky was in gainesville for the last game i'm looking at calipari i'm like i think he wants to be here less than i do like he is trying to get himself thrown out of this game he was almost was almost successful in getting himself thrown out of the game so uh there's there's times where and i mean i don't think he gave up but there's times where basketball coaches will throw their hands up in the air and say hey i'm not reaching these guys i'm not getting to them um and we'll get them next year and i don't think mike white ever got to that point but i do think he was really frustrated with not being able to knock some of that stuff out of them or, or get the most out of, out of this group. Graham? Yeah, I think that they would have got out of uh, the first game. Again, like Nick said, it all depends on matchups. But this was a team that was uh, severely flawed. I, I think that they lacked outside of a Kerry Blackshear, a veteran presence. Mm -hmm. um, you have to give, I think, the sophomores a whole lot of credit for maintaining the scoring load. Uh, fighting through injury, fatigue, um, and in the case of Keontae Johnson, elevating his game. But once the freshmen uh, were unable to carry a load like the freshmen did last year, those sophomores did last year, I think it was clear to a lot of people that this team had just had a much lower ceiling than we initially believed. You can blame some injuries to Gorjog Gak, Dante Bassett, and we all know the issues with the front court and the transfers. Um, it's been a perfect storm, and, and Mike White's recruits, I think, have only had three that have either gone to the pros or graduated since he's been here. Without that type of veteran depth, you don't win a lot of tournament games, so maybe one um, to answer the question, but this is a team that really needs an influx of uh, graduate transfers, and one uh, could only bring them so this year. Edgar? I think this team's track record throughout the season pretty much said – it was going to be hard for it to make a deep postseason run. Teams have done it over the years. You go back to the 80s, which is when I was really kind of getting into college basketball big time. I mean, you had teams like NC State and Villanova just come out of nowhere with 10 losses and win the tournament. Those were special seasons. I, you couldn't put anything past any team really that gets in. I mean, anyone can do something. But, and this team had some talent. But Kerry Blackshear really stumbled down the stretch. He got eight double-doubles in his first 17 games, not one in his last 14. The team had 27 games out of 31. They were either leading by 10 or losing by 10, mm -hmm. right? The team won two games that it was down by 20-plus and lost two games that it was up by 15-plus, including the final one to Kentucky, where if Florida played like that in the tournament, the first 30-whatever minutes of that game, it could have beaten a lot of teams and made a great run, but it never could sustain a 40 minute game. And it, it was, I'm sure it was very frustrating for Mike White, but I, I looked at it at times and was like, where's the accountability? Mm -hmm. I mean, the offensive rebounding was a tro or defensive rebounding would be atrocious at times. I mean, putbacks that were critical, they'd allow. And nobody was getting called out. You know, transition defense was an abysmal all year. Um, they give up, you know, long, big runs and no timeouts were called. So I, I think everybody's fingerprints were on this this season. And the off season is now going to get very interesting. And who's coming back? I mean, is Keontae Johnson really ready for the NBA at 6'5"? Where is he going to play? I mean, the guy's a wing. 
you know, he's going to get dominated at 6'5 at a wing position. He needs to get better and more and better outside shot. I know Graham loves the guy, but, I mean, he's undersized for the position. They're going to want him to play in the NBA and doesn't have the outside shot there yet. I mean, Nemard, you think, is as good as gone, right, based on last year I'm testing the waters. Well, uh, is he? Yeah. I mean, is I he ready? Where is he playing? So, well, like international <laughs> travel is, is not good right now, and that's what he's going to be doing if he plays good. basketball. Um, and, you know, where Trey Mann, I mean, what are his handlers telling him about this season? You know, Scotty Lewis, great, great athlete. I mean, I think he's their best NBA prospect in terms of just the athletic ability. I mean, Keontae certainly a good prospect too, but he has so many holes like in his offensive game and things, but he might leave. Scott, Mike White might have a really good team coming back next year. But he might have a shell of this team. We just don't know. Either way, he's going to be on the spot next year. I think people really need to see something from this program next season, in fairness, because this year was a huge disappointment. Jackie and or Matea? Yeah, um, I think... Hey, there's oh, Matea. Oh, he's still hiding behind my chair right now. <laughs> I want to talk about that. Hey, buddy. But, um, he was saying, um, you know, all of you guys have pretty much kind of touched on the big points. This was an underwhelming season when you think of all the talent that Florida had. Um, when you go into the tournament, you really have to look at matchups. But when you look at the emotional maturity of this team, you kind of question if they win that first game, are they able to handle that success and turn it around and forget about it and go back the next game and be able to win it. And that was the big problem that this team's had throughout most of the season. It's a, one of the most roller coaster teams I think I've covered in basketball. Uh, they just can't have that sustained energy throughout the entire game. And that's always what got them. Um, a lot of that is youth. Um, but at the same time, it was also they couldn't really figure out a rotation that worked consistently enough. And that's due to injury. That's due to fatigue. Like Graham mentioned, some of these guys did play through injury and fatigue because they didn't have the bench that they needed. Um, some of these games, you realize that once those five starters went on the bench, they didn't really have any production from those guys. And in a tournament like this, you need production from those guys on the bench because at some point you're going to have fatigue set in in a tournament setting like this. So I don't know if they would have gone past that first game. Um, and what Edgar kind of touched on, moving forward to next year, a lot of these guys could possibly not be here. I'm looking at Scotty Lewis. Mm -hmm. I don't think Keontae Johnson could, is going to be one that would move on to the next level yet, but I'm on Team Graham on this. I think Keontae Johnson was a guy that I felt like a lot of people Team thought were underrated. <laughs> he was a little underrated. There's no here, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah. He's you know, great. Don't get me wrong. He's a great <laughs> player. You know, like Graham and I talked about it last season. We thought Keontae was going to be one of the one of the freshmen at that point that was really going to step up in year two and it was going to make a difference. And I, I think he has that energy. The thing is, like, you, don't, you can't have one guy with the energy. Sometimes right. when we looked at the team, it seemed like one guy got, you know, in a hot streak and the other guy decided to fall asleep. And that was the problem this year. And that's what I don't think they would have passed maybe the second game in the tournament because if not everybody was on the same page, you're not going to win. Did you see the Twitter tournament? They yes. had him get past Colorado, Joe Lenardi Twitter tournament, and then lose by 20 to Dayton in the second round. So Anthony Grant. <laughs> that seemed probably fairly accurate. I don't know about 20 to Dayton, but one win, one and done again. And that's one going to cut it. I mean, for a team that a lot of people thought was at least final Sweet four. 16 at worst and maybe even a Final Four challenger. I'm glad y'all touched on a few of this already. So um, just to wrap it up, and Graham and Nick, you can touch on it as well. And I'm going to limit you to 30 seconds on this. Who do you think leaves? But more importantly, who's the most important that needs to come back for them to have a successful season next year? Well, I'll go first. Uh, I, I think that clearly you guys have mentioned Scotty Lewis. I think that that's a guy who you did see offensive improvement throughout the year. You saw him improve. In terms of team defense, I think he was overhyped in that regard. We knew the length, the athleticism. He still wowed people after 30 games with his athleticism. But he made massive strides in terms of transition defense, transition offense, um, team defense, understanding when to rotate, spacing, uh, things that will help him improve at the next level. But then there are certainly, I think, some concerns that may make him not that guaranteed lottery pick that I think a lot of people 
foresaw him being right when he got to Gainesville. His jump shot uh, did improve throughout the season, but he still has some um, mechanical things that he can improve upon. Uh, mainly his his arcing jump shot, I think, is not something you see as often in the NBA. Not saying it can't work, but there will be coaches and programs who express um, that being an issue to them, and that's something that they want to change. And when you get a 19-year-old, 18-year-old um, into the NBA at the next level, that may be a, a make or break thing because you really only do get one chance. So he seriously does have to weigh that as well. Um, and then I think obviously Keontae Johnson, that's the big one. You saw a lot of people um, look at him as a potential NBA draft option. I, I'm sorry, I've gone over 30 seconds here, but I think that he could possibly yeah. um, leave be just because of the strides that you saw him make in just what 50 starts at Florida. I don't even think that you look at guys in the NBA, an 82 game NBA season, you see massive improvement from rookies. If Keontae Johnson can do that in 50 games where he's had 15 different teammates and had no really, uh, let's be honest, no real big man uh, manning the middle because Kerry Blackshear is a true four at the next level. You could say that maybe his best basketball is yet to come because if he uh, does play the wing position, considering everything that he did in the post, he could translate really well in the NBA is all I'm saying. So I'll turn it over to you, Nick. I'm sorry I ate up all your time. I was going to say 30 Nick, seconds. I'm going to jump I'm <laughs> sorry. That's, that Coming horrible. from somebody who can't talk in 30 <laughs> seconds either. I know. Um, I know. Nick, I'm going to jump ahead for you. I agree with, I agree with Graham. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, oh, nice. um, <laughs> that's a good jump. Let's jump to baseball Love real quick. So baseball, considered a spring sport, those guys that had their season cut short will get an extra year from the NCAA. How many guys on this Florida team do you see taking advantage of that? And – is it necessary with what they have coming in? Um, no, it's it, baseball is going to be an absolute disaster. Um, with it, it, see, the two guys I think that really should come back are um, Kirby McMullen and, and Austin Langworthy. Um, Austin Langworthy, I don't think, has a professional career. He's already talked um, publicly about wanting to be a coach at the next level. So for him, he just got handed, you know, an extra year of baseball. Um, it might be the last chance he has to play. Um, competitively. So I think he's someone that, that would take advantage of it. Kirby McMullen, another guy who would be a late round pick as a senior. And then when you're a senior in college, you get, you know, Jake Mangum was the SC player of the year and the Mets signed him for $15,000 because, mm -hmm. I mean, or else you're going to go play baseball in Korea or Japan. If you want to play Major League Baseball and you're a senior coming out of college, you take what you get. Um, Tommy Mace and Jack Leftwich, they're not coming back. I know that, that was, you know, Gator fans, big, big ones. Hey, if we can get those guys back, they'll be will be great next year. Um, they're going to be drafted in the top five rounds, and they're going to be millionaires. They're, they're not going to be coming back to school. That'd be nice. Um, there's a couple guys, too, Jacob Young and Corey Acton. They're sophomores, but they're draft-eligible sophomores because they'll be 21. It'll be interesting to see even what the MLB draft looks like because they haven't finalized that yet. Um, but those are guys that would have that bargaining chip. Whether or not they got an extra year, they're sophomores. So they'd still be uh, – you know, if they got the year, they'd still be a sophomore. If they didn't get the year – um, they'd be juniors. It doesn't matter. They still have that bargaining chip when the draft comes along. Um, it's just going to be a, a log jam. And the D1 council is, is voting on that soon this week. Um, but you, a school like Florida, LSU, you know, the, the baseball powerhouses have to oversign because their signing classes get eaten up by the MLB draft. So now what happens to that kid that's at the bottom of the signing class, but Florida thought, yeah, we'll, we'll take him and he might be a two-year project. Um, we're going to need to fill up the class anyway. Well, now you've got, you know, you might have, they only have 11.7 scholarships, which isn't enough because you have to give someone at least 25%. And then you're looking at, you might have rosters with 50 guys. Like it, there's, it's, it's, it, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because the right thing to do is to give them an extra year of eligibility, but then you're looking at a sport that doesn't make money. Baseball operates at a loss, I think, everywhere except for LSU. Um, and now you're going to have, 40 kids on scholarship, you know, it, it's, a, it's the right thing to do is to give the kids the year back, but it's going to create long-term problems for the sport. And then real quick, because we need to move on to football. So a real I was going to say, that was an excellent answer. Ned. That was very good. I don't have anything to add, um, but a real 30 seconds, <laughs> not a gram 30 seconds. <laughs> FSU basketball managed to somehow get a decree from the uh, Florida State Congress that they are national champions. Does Florida baseball, let's not go as far as a decree through the Congress, but does Florida baseball deserve any sort of title or recognition for this season? 
No, they played 16 games of 56. No one deserves anything. 17. Good pat on the back. 17, 16 and one. Yeah, I mean, if you want, if you want to declare anyone, Ole Miss finished the season on a 16 game winning streak. They lost their oh. first game and then won the next 16. So oh. there you go. If you're doing that, Ole Miss is the baseball CF champ. national champs. Go follow Nick for your baseball. I, that's what I always tell people. Yeah. He knows it. He follows it. I want to talk some golf. We're going to talk masters. No, oh, not. I got a shirt um, and a hat on. <laughs> Good job. Okay, football, obviously spring practice is, is for all intents and purposes, canceled. Uh, you know, originally they had hoped to maybe postpone it. I think at this point, the most they can hope to do is possibly expand fall camp to make up for some of the practices they lost to spring practice. But nothing's happening for sure until April 15th. And then even after that, um, as Scott Strickland and Greg Sankey have said on a couple of different times, they don't foresee spring practice really happening at this point. So that being said, what would be the most – advantageous thing for every team because it has to be equitable across the league what would be the most advantageous thing for each team to do to make up for losing those 15 spring practices graham you go first you're first on my screen so. uh, that's a good question you know i i want to give an answer that you know gets kids in the program right away in june because usually we see you know another off-season workout program in june which again is so necessary to kids who just enroll right then um, but I really can't foresee things being back on track at that point. Just right now, I would love for us to, you know, be back to normalcy by mid-May here, if not sooner. I just don't see that happening, especially after you've seen UF um, kind of postpone some summer A already when it comes to in-person classes. So I can't imagine um, them having football, but who knows? Uh, I think the most, the best thing that they can do, and maybe I don't know how realistic this is, um, but a lot of these kids played seven on seven and I would love to see if we could possibly, you know, I know it's not social distancing, but in the next few months, if we could see a seven v seven, you know, Georgia versus Florida, or if, you know, God forbid the fall schedule like does get wiped out. If, if, if we could see something like that, um, I don't know, you know, the big three basketball league is stepping up right now with no NBA, they're still going to try and play. Um, I, I could see a 7v7 tournament or something done for charity if this does extend into June because people are going to miss football. They're going to miss sports. They already are. They're going to have to figure something out. If the NCAA doesn't move, if, if the government still has restrictions in place, I, I think we still see football in some capacity. And that's important to remember the SEC does have some autonomy with this. They can host their own events if they do feel the need to do so separate from the NCAA. Obviously, it's not ideal. But legally, they do have that right. Jackie, what would you want to see happen? Um, I would hope that they would be coming back for football practice. Hey, that's we. The problem. Yeah. I think that's the problem right now is that you know we've got guys spread out around the country and they're not getting that one-on-one -on -one time with Fisher, they're not getting one-on-one -on -one time with you know Savage, or not getting one-on-one -on -one time with their you know position coaches. So that's something that you know that it's invaluable at this point. Um, you got John Hevesy, who at this point would probably have rotated the guys across the old line to try and you know practice them in different positions, trying to get versatility among the guys, especially when he's trying to figure out maybe which garage is going to go left guard, maybe move him at left tackle and move Stone Forsyth to the right, see how far along Josh Braun has gone. Um, so getting them, you know, maybe some some guys on campus. Um, that's what I would hope because that's what you want to, you want to see these players get hands on with their coaches. You, you, that's what you would ideally want in that situation. Um, as far as spring practice, I agree with you. I think at this point, you're, there's not just enough time. And then you also have to take safety concerns too, because there's a reason why they don't do two days anymore. Um, that's something that the NCAA changed. So you have to also take safety concerns with the weather being so hot too. It's a lot of variables there. So maybe what they can do is maybe split it. Um, if, if hopefully everything comes down a little bit and things kind of start opening up around June, maybe beginning of July, maybe have a two week quick um, kind of get together with the team and coaches where they kind of have breakouts and individual drills first and take a break and then start fall camp. Something like that could possibly work in, in a, such a constricted schedule like that. Um, I don't know, like I understand what Graham's saying, maybe like a seven on seven, the SEC can kind of, come in there and help fans like that. I just don't see it happening mm -hmm. uh, right now. 
um, just because we don't know really about what social distancing, how, how long it's going to take, if there's going to be another uptick in cases. Um, we're, we're still waiting to see what's happening in Asia after, you know, they're flattening the curve. So I don't know if that's something that we would really see realistically and how they would do it as far as kind of organizing between teams. Because don't forget, it's state by state. So, you know, right now, Florida gets the uptick. But what happens, you know, in next month, Alabama gets in the uptick. So all the states are kind of having the cases a little bit differently. So you can't really organize a big scale event when you don't know what's going on in the state. And don't forget, players are back home and they're coming from different parts of the states too so let's say for example here in florida desante said anyone coming from new york and jersey has to quarantine themselves for 14 days so that's why i don't know if that seven on seven thing would happen but maybe like coming back to school and having them come two weeks earlier and still quarantining and and it's so much stuff going on so that's why i, I think maybe july is probably the best bet mm-hmm. of when they might come back and maybe do like a quick individual workout type of thing and then move on to fall camp right uh, going off of that, Edgar, I'm going to come to you next. Um, a, a point I've made a couple of times, and you may disagree with me, but a point I've made is that Florida not only has the same coaching staff, they have the same strength and conditioning staff, which is something Alabama, Georgia, schools like that can't say. Now, Alabama and Georgia are not going to fall too far behind, but the strength staff is really what gets you through spring and that off season. And so not having spring practice obviously hurts, but you have a a large majority of guys on your team that know what Nick Savage would have done with them in spring practice. They know what he would have had them do during the off season. And maybe they can lead that individually and help some of these younger guys with it. So that being said, how much does it hurt a team like Florida versus a team that has a new strength staff to not have spring practice and, and who on Florida's roster maybe needed those spring, those 15 practices, who did you want to see kind of excel during the spring and we'll need to take advantage of whatever is done in the fall. Sorry, that was a really long-winded question. That was good. It, no, it was practice. good. I, I have theories about the whole strength thing that, and Nick is like signed off, unfortunately, because he's like the big workout guy. He'll come back. Group. <laughs> Trust. Um, but yeah, they know what Nick, Nick would want from him. Nick Savage, that is, would want from him. And that's good. And I think this this team is really bought in to Dan Mullen and this whole program. I think you see um, that from the fact that only one guy left, unlike four last year, uh, C.J. Henderson, the only guy, but he's going to be a top 15 pick based on his combine price. But, um, yeah, so there's a lot of buy-in. So I think these guys are going to maintain dedication and focus. And that's good because that's the thing you got to worry about is these guys are off on their own playing video games. These linemen can pack on 10 pounds in a week. You know what I mean? You do not want guys coming back out of shape. Academic focus is critical right now. I mean, right? These kids can't be slacking off on their academics. And so there's a lot that the buy-in element's doing to help this program continue to propel itself forward where it was really hoping to make some strides this spring. But, you know, how can you simulate, and this is what I was going to say to Nick, how do you simulate the workouts? How do you simulate, you know, 600-pound deadlifts and 500-pound squat lifts and, and the things, you know, doing clean and jerks? I mean, you need supervision. You need spotters. You need, you know, a lot of people around you to do these things properly. So there's going to be drop-offs. Now, all programs are going to suffer this, of course. But Dennis Dodd wrote a fantastic article last week about – the potential of no football, right? Bronco Mendenhall raised the issue that maybe these be conference games. And in it, he spoke to a veteran um, strength strength coach from Michigan State, and he said you need six or eight weeks to get these guys ready for a football season, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that means summer B, which starts, what, late June, early July? These guys really got to be back on campus and in the the program at that point. And that's going to be key if you're going to start the season on time because you got to have these guys there. But there are all the things that have been mentioned by Jackie, offensive line rotations. You have a bunch of guys. You lost 55%, I think, of your production in the receiving core. You have players, Jacob Copeland, for example, that needed to make strides. And he's a big one if you want a guy right there who needs to learn the offense, needs to improve his pass catching reliability. Um, that, that's going to be essential going forward. Um, you know, Emory Jones is shot 
to challenge Kyle Trask that people thought was going to happen. I'm skeptical that he was going to take the job, but he's going to be play a bigger and bigger role. And, you know, that hurts him. The list goes on. And speaking of social distancing, at least Trey Dean did get a jump on that last season, I think, um, based on his coverage skills. But uh, I, I do think that the Gators will, however, ultimately come out of this better than probably the two teams on the schedule that should be the most concerned. And that's LSU and Georgia. UF schedule, to me, is pretty navigable next year. Um, that's a word butchered that year that word I mean but next year those are the two big obstacles and Mm -hmm. LSU lost Joe Brady and Joe Burrow Georgia has a new quarterback a new offensive coordinator Mm -hmm. the Gators have a quarterback in place and a system in place it's proven to work and Mm -hmm. that gives the Gators a good advantage on those two programs so Uh, that's at least a silver lining yeah Nick Edgar mentioned some of those players that needed spring practice um I don't know if he necessarily needed it to improve, but I was interested. I know this is a cliche answer, but I was interested to see Kyle Trask because this would have been his first off season where he was unquestionably the guy last spring. It was still Felipe. Um, and, you know, I think about one day when they were coming in and Felipe was the first in Kyle Trask and Emory were at the back of the line and Nick Savage told him, don't ever show up at the back of the line again as a quarterback. And, um, uh, the next day, here comes Kyle Trask and Emory Jones in the front, and then Felipe sprints past them to get in first. That's got to be the attitude that Kyle Trask takes, would have taken into spring practice his first offseason, unquestionably, as the guy. Um, so I was interested to see him. But who were some of the guys, Nick, that you wanted to see, and what will you be looking for when we do hopefully get into fall camp um, to see who kind of took advantage of the offseason on their own and, and made some strides to impress? I actually, I actually wrote about it, um, but oh yeah, the, I definitely the first, read all your stuff. Yeah, <laughs> the first guy on my list was um, was Trey Dean, but just based on the interview that you and I did with him mm-hmm. uh, after the Orange Bowl, where I mean, after his freshman year, before spring practice, for the last spring practice, he was asked to go to safety and told him he had no interest. Um, so they tried him at that you know star, and that was a disaster. So. Um, I think it was just the maturation, even after, uh, you know, Florida has an Orange Bowl win and ends a great season, to tell us, you know, I think you asked him, point blank, perfect world, where do you want to play? And he said, love to play cornerback, but I'll play safety. And to come in, he said, in a year. He said, not nickel. <laughs> not nickel. Not nickel. Yeah. He said, I'd love to play corner, not nickel, I play safety. Uh, made sure to put not nickel. I, I I don't think the coaches are worried about trading, wanting to play nickel. That's not in his future uh, at Florida. Um, but to me, that just showed maturation. So I wanted to see how he, how he fit in there. Cause I mean, you've got guys back there, Donovan Steiner returns, um, Sean Davis, Brad Stewart. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting somebody, but you've got guys returning, but for one reason or another, whether it, whether it was off the field stuff with Brad or staying healthy with Sean Davis, it, it just, you haven't been able to just put two guys or three guys back there. So how did he, how would he fit into that mix? I wanted to see where is Amari Bernie, if he's healthy, going to play? Is he a weak side linebacker? Is he, uh, does he move into star? Does, do you put him back to safety? That's where he came to Florida. I mean, he was a freshman uh, when he first got on the campus, that's where he played. So um, those are going to be two guys for me. Who's going to play nickel? If it's not going to be, um, Trey Dean, do you slide Marco in there? He came back for his senior season. I'm sure he doesn't want to solely play there and wants to play outside. Um, so those, those are some of the guys. And then with Jeremiah Moon not being able to go, I wanted to see who would fill in. And, and then also a healthy Malik Davis. And how's the running back uh, rotation shift? Because you've got Lorenzo Lingard, um, Malik Davis. Who am I forgetting? Damian Pierce. Uh, Damian Pierce. Um, there you Naquan have five running back. Naquan right. You've got five running backs again, and it, without a clear one like we had last year with with Michael Pirine, what does that rotation look like? So there was there were going to be a lot of questions, and obviously Jackie mentioned the offensive line. How has that piece together? Um, I guess we'll we'll find out. You know when or if uh, a camp. It won't be spring or summer camp or whatever happens, but. There were certainly a lot of questions I had going into spring. A oh, bunch of tons. great stories oh, that you'll never you read. Were, go ahead. 
I, I had so many great stories written and it'll just never be published. <laughs> right. My best, yeah. my best stories are not published. Yeah. The best stories that people never read. They'll never know. The safety mm -hmm. you were getting was Juwan Taylor, but we'll forgive you that because he graduated. So he wouldn't have been returning. And, um, I think you mentioned who would fill in for Jeremiah moon. I think that's an interesting one, but if there's one guy where I'm not really worried about being disciplined on the off season, it's my mood Diabate. So I think probably would have been that guy. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not worried about him. <laughs> he'll, he'll be fine. He'll take care of himself. Uh, so yeah, Graham and Jackie, I know y'all talked about the camp. So just real quick, who, Jackie, you talked about the offensive line, but anybody in particular that you need to see come back from fall camp and, and know that they did what they needed to do during this time on their own? Um, yeah, I, Brett Heggie was one guy that I wanted to kind of stress on the O-line because he is most likely moving into that center position, obviously, with Cannon on gone. So that's the guy that you want to really see that improvement, see if he can take a leadership and kind of take that um, – the young guys and kind of help them kind of move forward. So that's the guy that was really important. And honestly, too, see how John DeLance did on the off season, see how his foot is feeling, seeing how he's healthy, how much progress he's made. Um, Cause that could be the key of if John Hevesy is thinking, you know, should I keep Richard garage inside or should I move him to left and foresight to, um, to right? So that's, those are all the questions that I had for the O-line, but I kind of agree with some of the names that Nick said, um, Trey Dean, you know, obviously Mateo agrees. He really wanted to see Trey Dean and see how much he's improved because he's a key to figuring out how that secondary is going to look. Um, from what I've heard, Amari Bernie looks like he's going to kind of slide into star. That's the most likely scenario that we were listening to and hearing. That's that. where they wanted him last season, right? And yes, just that's numbers that had to keep him at linebacker. Yeah, and now they have numbers at linebacker. So why, that's why I think with him moving the star and Chester Kimbrough would have been that backup. So that's why I feel like that would have been such a good thing to watch in spring, see how Amari Bernie is doing at star. He did well behind Chauncey Garner Johnson his first year. So seeing how he does there, how healthy he is after, you know, that couple of injuries that he had last year. Um, see how far along Chester Kimbrough was. We did keep hearing of how Chester Kimbrough was one of the corners, the young corners that people were impressed with. Um, Van Jefferson was talking about him in glowing terms last summer. So that's the guy that I also wanted to see. So kind of following what Nick was saying, O-line, secondary, running back room. I know Dan Mullen said he's more curious to see about Malik Davis. So how far did he go? How far is he, you know, mentally? That's a great point. I, I think something you said really stood out that Trey Dean's kind of the, the wild card here. What he does determines what the rest of the secondary will do or where the coaches put him because they do like him and understandably so. Yeah, he didn't have a great year at nickel, but he's, he's way too talented to just keep on the bench. Um, even if that means telling him, like it or not, you're going back to safety. Uh, but what he does will determine what pretty much the entire secondary does. Graham, wrapping it up because we are – Real quick, real quick, 30 seconds. I know that Edgar brought up Jacob Copeland. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say Kadarius Tony. That was the guy who last minute decided to come back to the Gators, and I think that there's a huge void at wide receiver this year, especially in terms of production, but I think even more so in terms of leadership. This team is really going to miss guys like Freddie Swain, Josh Hammond, Van mm -hmm. Jefferson, because those guys brought it every single day. You knew what you were getting. You know, I think Trey Grimes is more than capable of being Florida's deep threat, being the number one. Oh, Tyree Cleveland, obviously another one out the door. Um, but Kadarius Tony has never really proven that he can be a true, true prototypical wide receiver. Most of his yards come um, getting the ball in the backfield. Uh, I don't think that he really has proven he can be the number two guy. And I would have liked to see him assert himself in spring camp. I think he has to come back focused and fall. And he's one of those ones that I think that you would be a little bit worried about losing focus in the summer, knowing that he has a lot of other interests and a lot of other talents. So certainly that's the one as well. I think that Florida will, will certainly miss uh, that leadership at wide receiver. And if they can get that um, from any of those guys, it will absolutely be a, a huge thing for Florida's uh, college football playoff hopes. Yeah. You can't put a price on what those four seniors brought in experience. Um, real quick, just yay or nay, I'll go down and you give me yes or no. Heat. Some heat. Do you think, Lorenzo Lingard and um, Justin Shorter get their waiver to play this season. We're, we're assuming there's a season. But do you think Lorenzo Lingard and, and Justin Shorter get their waiver to play this season? Yay or nay? Graham? Absolutely. I, I think you look at, one, the Penn State situation. 
uh, very clear. And then you look at Lorenzo Lingard, a guy who transferred for, for seemingly all the right reasons. Uh, I think that they get their waivers without a doubt. The NCAA right now should have nothing else to do. They should not <laughs> be dragging their feet on this. Just clear the guys so they can know and that they know that they're learning their offense um, with a chance to play. Because I think right now there's a whole lot of uncertainty out there. Give them a little bit of certainty. Nick, yay or nay? Uh, yeah, I'd say for shorter, for sure. Um, and then with Lingard, he has an actual family need, so it's probably a coin flip. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, how the NCAA true. operates. Jackie, yay yeah or nay on Lingard and shorter? Yay, I'm keeping it short just like you asked, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie, for following the rules. Edgar, I'm yay sorry. on I'm Lingard sorry. and shorter? Yay. Yay. <laughs> there we go, Edgar. <laughs> um, Everyone's better at following directions than me. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm embarrassed. Whatever. You didn't even bring your cat so we could make fun of you like we told you. Uh, they're not as well behaved as Matea. <laughs> um, guys, thank y'all right. for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Do y'all miss Good me? Good job, Cassidy. Do you miss me? You can, you can tell the truth. I miss you all. We miss, e we all, we miss everybody. This is like, this isolation is getting this like seclusion or whatever, sheltering. It's a little much. Hug you all when I see you again. Um, Thank y'all for doing this and for talking a little far to sports because I know people miss it just as much as we do or as much as we miss the work. So I will talk to y'all at a later time. Stay safe and stay home. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. See ya.